I am a newcomer to academia, let alone to activism and praxis work. I often wonder, did I choose queer theory or did queer theory choose me? The answer is not straightforward. Sometimes I think I have been unknowingly gyrating around queer theory for the longest duration of my life before it finally swept me in. Other times, I think I spent a life of perpetual irritation because something about our world just didn't sit right with me. And by me here, I mean us. And before I knew it, I find myself surrounded by like-minded peers, the majority of whom I shall never meet, working together towards the there and then that are yet to be. My life trajectory and situatedness has and continues to shelter me from the imminent violence and precarity that innumerable women, trans folks, forcibly displaced, settler occupied, and queer bodies find themselves in. I am a lucky recent graduate who found a permanent and full-time job two years from graduating, and I insist on luck. If my work has indeed led me to where I am, then it is imperative that we remind ourselves and everyone that feminist and queer writing are inherently collaborative. And by collaborative, I mean the irrefutable fact that they both emerge from sites of momentous violence. Flesh and feelings are part and parcel of the theory we produce. And to not transform our theorizing into praxis is to inherently betray the legacies of those who came before us and delay the there and then that we aspire to or for, I'm not sure of the proposition. When I imagine the there and then, I imagine this. I imagine on our daily commutes, while preparing dinner, all while showering, listening to post podcasts that historicize and contextualize and that dissipate intersectional knowledge, a sort of top 10 billboard of agitation and works without the ranking, of course, because we don't like numbers. We need to disseminate the knowledge we produce, and we are in the unique position that our academic endeavors cannot and will not be dissociated from activism per se. Perhaps we need more YouTube channels and less journals. I embrace, I embrace my work at Koh, and I embrace my work at my university. I also mock the internal ref review that scored my Koh article out of all my submissions two stars out of four for lack of theoretical engagement. It is difficult to balance between open access work and high flying academic journeys. My gratitude goes on this note to the many names and faces in our audience who have at some point and time invested in the unpaid labor demanded to sustain Koh. Our lives, trajectories are endless U-turns, reorientations, recalibration and accommodation. What weighs on our mind and hearts is permanent. It lingers with us in the cinema, at restaurants, in the classroom, in the spa for some, on the beach, in airports, on hiking days and lazy ones. Along the way, we sometimes lose friends and family members who have had enough of our killjoy attitude. Of course, a nod to our discussion, Sarah Ahmed, on this point. We live in a world that bases itself on the speculation and effects of a fragile and at this stage farcical whiteness that is clearly, at least in my future oriented wishful thinking, losing grip on itself. Its reaction since the mobilizations that ensued from kill the killing of George Floyd range from that of a deer caught in headlights to apocalyptic um, to apocalyptic visions about a world where whites and non-whites live on par, what a calamity, to increasingly clumsy and dangerous epistemic assemblages. To our Kohl allies, the task ahead is long, demanding, costly, and relentless. In the end of the day, and for all the tensions that come with balancing the identity politics with supranational injustices, we merely have each other. And to the younger among us, and by that I mean our authors, Ahmed, Aya, Noor, Sarona, all the rest of our contributors, 
And to all of us intersectional queer feminists out there, we stand in solar solidarity with your writing, practices, and interventions. Thank you.